If I were to pick one category of living things that has been absolutely necessary for human civilization, it would be grass. Yes, you heard me, grass. No, not, not that type of grass necessarily in your front yard. That's actually just a bunch of wasted space and a lot of wasted water, and there's far better landscaping you can have. When I'm talking about grass, I'm talking about the grasses that we eat. Now, obviously, typical grass that you think of when you hear the word grass is not edible. The cellulose requires four stomachs, or more accurately, a stomach composed of four major parts, the cacao, to actually digest. However, there are plenty of other types of grasses known as cereals, and I'm not just talking about Fruit Loops, that are actually essential for human civilization, and have been around for over 10,000 years. Grass is actually a lot older than 10,000 years, in fact it's around 25 million years old when it first emerged in the evolutionary game. Trees aren't the only type of vegetation out there, neither are ferns. If you add some flat land with some water but not too much, you could have giant fields of grasses. On top of that, these grasses would provide calories for grazing animals that in turn would be hunted by other animals, providing the basis for an ecosystem. Far later on, humans came onto the scene, and while they were for the first moments of our history hunter-gatherers, they occasionally gathered some of these seeds. Eventually, some of these humans caught on to the fact that you can harvest some of these seeds, plant them and grow them and get more seeds, and you can regenerate your own food, hence agriculture. Many humans oftentimes would cross-pollinate and cross-breed certain types of grasses to produce more results, better results, more calories and nutrition. These grasses also did particularly well with relatively flat elevation and easy access to water, the same places where the first human civilizations emerged. Grasses are also pretty tough, they're pretty hardy for the most part, and they can handle a wide variety of climates, and they can also last fairly long without water, for the most part with a few exceptions, unlike many other types of plants that have very specific care requirements. On top of that, grasses are very easy to proliferate. Now, our mammalian brains are wired to find them absolutely delicious, namely because our taste buds like high caloric grains as it signals to our brain that there are tons and tons of calories with all that glorious dopamine. Now, let's start off with grain that started civilization itself, or more specifically, the grain, wheat. This is a type of grass that was first cultivated around, you guessed it, the Fertile Crescent, in what is now Iraq and Syria, the birthplace of civilization. Even though the civic institutions of these countries today are rather lacking, they once were at the top of their game, at least the area was. The calories provided by these grains would produce a surplus that led to a diversification of labor. This meant that not everybody had to be farming and producing food. This in turn led to permanent settlements that allowed a whole bunch of other people to partake in other professions such as smithing, carpentry, and writing. Scribes could now write things down, and thereby we now have history. The natural forms of wheat that existed in nature were not as calorie dense as their modern counterparts. Our modern forms of these seeds came about through thousands of years of cross-pollinating certain types of plants that had certain characteristics that we wanted. This work was by and large done by women. It's important to note that unlike a lot of other plants, there are a lot of plant-based proteins in wheat. It's not just empty carbs. And it's kind of hard to think about that when you think of Wonder Bread today, but a lot of bread actually has quite a lot of micronutritional content and fiber. So here you have a crop that provides you not only with calories, but also protein. And you don't need to be too reliant on protein from animals for that reason. And as a result, you can ditch hunting, at least to some degree. And the fiber ensures that you can take really good shits. Because of all the adventures that came along with producing this grain, you saw bustling civilizations in Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt, and eventually wheat would spread into Central Asia and parts of East Asia, even in areas typically associated with rice. Usually when you think of a region such as East Asia, you typically think of rice, but in fact northern China has a lot of wheat-based dishes, 
Now, humans eventually found ways to breed certain strains of wheat that could adapt to certain climates. So long as you had a relatively flat surface of land and relatively good soil, these grasses could compete in pretty harsh winters that were too cold or summers that were too hot and dry. This made them not necessarily completely famine-proof, but pretty famine-hardy. The places that did the best with wheat were places with black soil. The most notable and well-known areas with black soil today are probably Ukraine and Southeast Russia. These parts of the world actually export the greatest sums of wheat, and they are responsible for feeding vast sums of people in sub-Saharan Africa, which by and large rely on wheat production. After all, many of these countries in Africa and the Middle East lacked the agricultural infrastructure and rainfall needed to produce such large, vast quantities of wheat to feed their populations. The reliance on flatbread that is based upon wheat is a major source of subsidence for many working class people in the Middle East and North Africa, and any problem that happens in the supply chain tends to cause significant issues, as we saw with the civil war in Syria in the previous decade and a half. I would not be surprised if the current conflict in Ukraine will cause certain geopolitical consequences indirectly down the line, as Ukraine is a massive wheat exporter. Thankfully, many other regions of the world have imported wheat seeds that have gone on to grow their own wheat industries with significant success, such as the savanna areas of South America in Argentina and Brazil, as well as Australia and certain parts of North America, namely the Canadian province of Saskatchewan, which in many ways produces some of the highest quality wheat in the world, which actually originally came from Ukraine, as many Ukrainians had moved to Canada during the 1800s and early 1900s, and they did what their ancestors did in Ukraine, farm wheat and freeze to death. Unfortunately today, while we still are really good at providing a lot of calories, at a relatively cheap manner, this hyper-processization of food has resulted in removing a lot of the micronutritional properties that usually existed in wheat-based products. This is part of the reason why you're better off eating brown bread than white bread in most situations. However, due to economies of scale and certain logistics with food processing, white bread has become much more common, even though nutritionally it is clearly inferior in most cases. Another very important grain throughout human history has been barley. Now, when you hear the word barley, you probably think of beer. And that's correct because barley, by and large, is used for beer production today. And who doesn't love getting drunk? Throughout much of human history, barley was used as a primary form of carbohydrate, like wheat was in certain parts of the world, as barley tends to be tougher than wheat and more adaptive to certain climates that are by and large drier, and areas when there's a higher level of salinity in the soil. As strange as it sounds, that works better in colder climates in some areas, as colder climates tend to use salt to melt the snow. So what do you know? But at the end of the day, barley is mostly about the production of alcohol today. Most people don't really eat barley grain, such as pearl barley, even though it's actually pretty good nutritionally. Now, you may have heard of the term malt liquor. This pretty much comes from the sprouting seeds of barley cereals, and sometimes wheat, which is used to produce the cheapest, crappiest beer. On top of that, we also use malt barley for recipes, such as New York-style bagels. Funny enough, despite the association with alcohol, it was really the ancient peoples of the Middle East that used barley for beer processing in a part of the world that now has some of the lowest rates of alcohol consumption. Overall, barley consumption isn't particularly high among most human cultures, at least nowhere near to the same level as wheat, but it is still widely fed to livestock. Now let's look at another highly overlooked grain and that's rye. In fact, when you think of rye, you probably think of catcher in the rye, or maybe rye bread that is really brownish, that some people love and some people hate. Rye is known for being particularly resistant to cold weather. It's kind of like the most badass form of grass, and it's able to handle some of the toughest temperatures, even those in Northern Europe and parts of Russia which have frigid winters. It can grow and flourish in nutrient-deficient soil as well, which makes it particularly useful for people living in tough areas with really crappy soil. However, with the rise of more advanced technology in agriculture, rye, like barley, has taken the backseat to wheat, 
and is largely used for alcohol like whiskey and beer, or to feed livestock. Nonetheless, it still tends to be popular among some bakers, particularly in parts of the world like Scandinavia. Another widely overlooked grain is millet. In sharp contrast to rye, which does very well in cold temperatures, millet does very well in warmer climates. This is part of the reason why it's particularly popular in Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly West Africa, oftentimes used in the form of sorghum, which I'm mispronouncing. In other parts of the world, it's also popular for ethanol production as a biofuel. However, the origins of millet are far older. Typically, we associate millet with Sub-Saharan Africa, but it actually started out in East Asia. Chances are, some sort of proto-Chinese civilization was the first one to produce millet on a large scale, which led to the production of quasi-states that would form a sort of proto-Chinese civilization. It was particularly popular in Northern China and Korea. Today, however, it is mostly associated with the Sahel region, which is a quasi-desert region between the Sahara Desert to the north and the more lush portions of Sub-Saharan Africa to the south. These forms of millet are quite drought resistant, which is very important in an area where rainfall is not necessarily guaranteed. Today, it is only beaten out by corn, rice and wheat, but some estimates do place barley slightly ahead. However, most Westerners have never even heard of this grain. Nonetheless, in recent years, it has become more popular in Western countries due to the fact that it lacks gluten, which can be useful for people with a wheat allergy, or in some cases used to trick people without wheat allergies into buying stuff that is overpriced. An even more obscure but nonetheless important grain that is very common in Africa is teff. Teff is the smallest grain in the world that we know of, and is quite commonly used for injera. Injera is a soft, spongy bread that is fundamental to Ethiopian cuisine. It is oftentimes served alongside stews as a source of calories, but is also used as a utensil. However, it is quite expensive to get outside of East Africa, and this leads many Ethiopian restaurants here in the West to mixing teff with other sorts of grains to produce injera. Let's move on to a grain that's not as obscure though, rice. Ever heard of it? Rice is responsible for feeding more people than arguably any other crop in all of existence. It's most popular obviously in Asia, namely East Asia and the Indian subcontinent, in sharp contrast to the Middle East, as early civilizations here were preferential towards rice than they were by and large towards wheat and barley. Now, rice was unsurprisingly domesticated in China 10,000 years ago. Producing rice requires a lot of input. Oftentimes, you have to create rice paddies that require a lot of advanced irrigation techniques and a lot of rainfall. This is part of the reason why East Asian cultures have such a strong work ethic, as building infrastructure for rice farming is a pretty astounding feat in and of itself. It also requires a great deal of work to actually operate rice farms. This again may explain why some East Asian cultures are associated with such high rates of productivity. Many oftentimes wonder why China and India also have very large populations, and this is in part due to rice. Both of these cultures are close to the Himalayas, a giant mountain range with giant glaciers that melt, bringing in not only water through their rivers but also minerals into large river systems such as the Ganges in India or the Yellow River in China. This is excellent for rice production. Eventually, certain strains of rice like jasmine rice emerge in Thailand that would become mostly associated with Southeast Asian cooking, among others, whereas basmati rice would be more associated with Indians, as well as Iran. Eventually, rice would make its way to Europe, with styles like arborio rice which is popular in northern Italy and parts of Spain. While rice is usually associated with the old world, there are certain types of rice that are found in the new world, namely what we call quote-unquote wild rice, which was first cultivated by Native Americans and is relatively common in the southern United States. In more recent years, there have been continued controversies over the way rice paddies produce greenhouse gases, namely methane. The reason for this is that unlike wheat or corn, rice paddies have to be submerged. And by submerging a lot of vegetation, you lead to decomposition which leads to rotting vegetation, which leads to methane production, which is far worse than CO2. Next up, corn, or maize for you Brits out there. 
In sharp contrast to most other types of crops I've talked about, corn comes from the New World, also known as the Americas. That means that throughout much of recorded history, people in Europe, Asia, and Africa had no idea corn existed, let alone the massive ramifications it would have on the world. I would argue that the domestication of corn is quite possibly the most important contribution of the New World, and it has led to the bedrock of some quite impressive civilizations. Most people already know that during pre-Columbian times, the most advanced civilizations were either in Mesoamerica and what is now Mexico, and some smaller countries on the border, or in the Andean Mountains regions in around Peru, Ecuador, and Bolivia. It is most likely that corn was first cultivated in what is now Mexico, particularly in the Oaxaca Valley. This area had river valleys and a lot of really good soil that was relatively flat for growing grasses, and it made it perfect for producing what we now know as corn, even though the corn of the time was quite different than the corn we eat today. Corn became the bedrock of Mayan civilization, later Aztec civilization, and eventually moved south to be an integral part of Andean civilization, most famously the Inca. However, they also had potatoes to use. Also, fun fact, one of the very few types of alcohol that was produced in pre-Columbian times in the Americas comes from corn. Incan corn beer is actually pretty damn good. I had it in Peru. Should try it out. Corn has also been very important as a biofuel, even though it's less efficient than sugarcane. On top of that, it is primarily used for livestock feeding, and a great deal of cows that humans eat are fed by corn. This can be very efficient, but unfortunately, cows are not accustomed to eating corn. They prefer other types of grasses, and as a result, this leads to them farting and burping a lot, which produces a lot of methane. Corn is also used for production of cornstarch, and most notably, high fructose corn syrup, which is put into an insane variety of processed foods. And there you have it, some of the most important grains that our civilization relies upon. Oftentimes we eat grains such as quinoa, soybeans, or buckwheat, but they're not actually grains in the scientific sense, so I left them out, and even some of the grains I mentioned in this video are debatable. Nonetheless, I thank you guys for watching a video about what would otherwise be one of the most boring subjects in existence that I hope, perhaps, maybe, just maybe, was a little bit more interesting than you expected. Thanks for watching.